Hi, everyone. Welcome to our virtual speaker series. I'm Bella. I'm an intern for the CMC, so I'm going to be presenting our speaker tonight. Um, Joanna Garten is author of Edge on the Map. The Colorado Mountain Club, I'm sure as all of our members know, is an outdoor nonprofit that has been around since 1912 with the goals of Colorado recreation, conservation, and ed education. As part of an adapting to the recent times, we've moved a lot of our educational opportunities online. We are so grateful for our members and participants like you who continue to help support C the CMC's mission and passion for the mountains. If you can, we appreciate all the help we can get on this climb. Please consider donating to the CMC's education efforts, especially if you like this event. Now, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Zoom by now. If you would, please keep yourself mute and your um, video off. That helps the presentation run a little more smoothly and keeps all the background noise gone. And we will answer all questions at the end of the presentation that way. We don't have any interruptions, so if you have any questions, just please put them in the chat and we'll tackle them at the end together. So now I'm going to introduce Joanna Garten. She is an author, a mother, a proud Wisconsin girl, and a long distance runner. Before the publication of her first book, Awakening East, she doubled in nonprofit consultant, consulting, college teaching, and had a brief but quickly extinguished career as a lawyer. She moved her family to China. She has been charged by an elephant, run 20 plus marathons, and is addicted to sweaty 6 a.m. yoga classes. Among the things she's trying to do better are reading roadmaps and keeping the family dog out of the garbage can and being on time for anything, anywhere. Edge of the Map involved three years of worldwide research and writing it. It's her second book. So tonight, we're gonna, uh, Joanna's going to talk about her new book, and it's called Edge of the Map, and it's equal parts inspiring, dramatic, and heartbreaking. One of America's greatest high-altitude mountaineers, Christine Bos Boscoff, was at the top of her career when she and her partner died in avalanche in 2006. Charismatic, principled, and humble, Boscoff was also a deeply loved role model to her climbing partners in the Sherpa community. Edge of the Map traces the sharp twists and turns of Boscoff's life from her early years as a Lockheed engineer, through her successes in the climbing world, to her purchase of the Seattle-based Mountain Madness after the owner and climber Scott Fish. Fisher died in a 1996 Everest disaster. Her life was one of the constant achievements mixed with personal tragedy. This story follows Boscoff as she perseveres and moves on to bigger peaks, earning acclaim as a world-class mountaineer, then later as she finds an alpine partnership with legendary Colorado climber Charlie Fowler. So now we're going to let Joanna talk a little bit about her new book, and please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the box and we'll try and answer them all at the end. But I'm going to stop sharing so we can hear from Joanna. Great. Thank you, Bella. That was such a great introduction. I so appreciate it. And I'm so thrilled to be here tonight. I was chuckling because as you were reading that introduction, you mentioned keeping the dog out of the garbage can. <laughs> and... Um, I'm in Colorado, obviously, as I know probably most of you are. And before we got on, I was telling Bella that I was up in the mountains today and my dog had sort of an encounter with a porcupine. And that was a first. I had never experienced that. So that was kind of a traumatic way to start the day. But we're all good. <laughs> we're all good now. We are de-quilled. And uh, I'm excited to end the day this way. So very happy to be here. I am going to share my screen now. I've got about a 25 minute presentation and um, it kind of goes over my journey with Edge. Let's see, let's see if I can do that. How's that? That's going to work, right? Bella, you tell me if it looks funny, but it, I think it's looking okay on my end. But let me know if it doesn't, if it's not working on that end. So, so I've got about a 25 minute, minute presentation on my journey with Edge. And then hopefully I can answer your questions. So as I'm talking, as Bella said, please feel free to shoot those questions to her and she'll kind of keep track of those for the end. So uh, I am a writer. As I said, I'm based in Denver and Edge is my second book. My first book was published in 2015 and it was about the adoption of my two children from China and our subsequent move to China where we lived for a very wacky year. 
So I have been working on books full time now for about six years. And prior to that, I had a number of different careers. As you heard, I was trained as a journalist and as a lawyer. I've worked in nonprofits for many years. And then I taught at Regis University here in Denver for about 10 years. And now I am writing. So this is the first book that I wrote. It's called Awakening East. And again, it was published in 2015. So it's a great book um, for those of you who either have adopted from China or know anybody who has gone through the process of adopting from China. Really great book for them. So this is where I like to start my presentation. Um, and this is a presentation mostly geared for those of you who have not read the book. I, I'm pretty sure there are some of you on our um, chat tonight who have started it and maybe even finished it. So some of this will be repetitive if you're, if you've already turned the last page of Edge, um, but hopefully it'll be equally interesting. So this is where I like to start presentations. Um, and it's with this, this incredible picture of Everest that was taken last year in May that a lot of you are probably familiar with. And it was taken by Nims Persia, who is a Nepalese mountaineer, and he was attempting to summit Everest, and it shows this just horrendous queue of climbers on the way to the summit. And I always like to include it at the start of my presentation to sort of illustrate where my journey with Edge started. And it wasn't on top of Everest. Uh, it was, actually, because like so many of you, in fact, all of you, I'm sure, I've always been really fascinated by mountain stories, and I'm not a climber, and I wouldn't even consider myself an accomplished mountaineer. I mean, I live in Colorado, so I'm out hiking all the time. So I guess maybe I am on some level, but I definitely don't attempt 8,000 meter peaks. But for my entire life, I've just been very drawn to stories that take place in the mountains. And I've always wanted to understand the mentality of climbers. And I've been very intrigued by the risks and the drama and the losses, the grief, all of those exhilarating highs. All of it has just really been fascinating to me. So after the publication of my first book, I began looking for a second project. And I had three projects in mind. One was kind of a piece of chiclet, I guess is what you call it, a fluffy piece of chiclet that was going to be a, kind of a novel. And then the second story that I had in mind to tell was more academic. I wanted to write a, a sort of a deep dive into China's one-child policy. And then there was a story that my mother, who was also a writer, had been working on. And this was the story of Christine Boscoff. And she had been working on Christine's story for about 10 years, but she slowly began to realize that she would not be able to finish the book because of the advancement of Parkinson's disease, which she had been living with for a few years. And so at the point that she decided she couldn't finish the book or her research, I offered to help. And so I'm going to share a little bit with you about how she got involved with Chris's story at the end, but I just wanted to sort of tell you kind of how I picked this book, and it was from three very different projects. So off I went, working on Chris's story, and kind of not having any clue how deep I was going to fall into her story, but her story was so beautifully compelling on so many levels, and of course I had heard bits and pieces of the story over the years as my mother had worked on it. And so the headline from Chris's life, from her professional life, I should say, was that she was the only American woman to have summited six of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. And it was a record she set in the year 2000. And it's a record that still stands today, 20 years later, which is truly quite unbelievable. She had gone from a successful career as an aerospace engineer into the sport of mountaineering in her mid twenties, which some people would say is a little bit late. But she did. And she and her husband, Keith, who was 17 years older than her, had bought a Seattle Adventure Travel Company Mountain Madness from the estate of Scott Fisher, who was a guide who had died on Everest in 1996. And so a lot of us remember that tragedy through the lens of John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, which I'm sure many, if not all of you, have read. I think it was published in April 1997 instant bestseller. It had been based on an article that had run an outside magazine because Krakauer had been attempting to summit with a New Zealand company and there was just a terrible disaster on Everest and he eventually wrote Into Thin Air. So after Scott died, the company was sold to Chris and Keith Boscoff. So this is 
into thin air. And here's a great picture of Chris, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, she just had an absolutely breathtaking rise in the sport of mountaineering. And given that she was a woman, her accomplishments were truly notable because it was a sport and still is a sport, as you all know, that is really dominated by men, especially at that level, the 8,000 meter peak bagging level. But she never saw her gender as what defined her. And to me, that was really what made this story so inspiring and so captivating. It was kind of who she was and how she approached this passion with truly, I always like to say, humility is really the best word that really made the story one that I felt and my mother felt one that really needed to be told. So there are just many twists and turns in her story and in the narrative. So I don't want to give away any spoilers, but what is not a spoiler and what also kind of makes this an interesting book is that we all know as we open the book that in 2006, uh, Chris perished in an avalanche in Western Sichuan province with her climbing partner and her boyfriend, Charlie Fowler. So it's a very interesting book because we kind of all know that going into the story and yet somehow it's actually a pretty much a page turner. So this is a picture of Chris and Charlie. This is actually the last photo of them. They had gone to explore remote parts of Sichuan province. And when they did not return on their flight home, a search and rescue operation ensued. And at the time, Chris and Charlie were living in Norwood, Colorado, just outside Telluride. So the search involved kind of a coordinated effort between friends in Norwood and Telluride and the Seattle offices of Mount Madness, and then also officials in China. So it was kind of involving these three different entities, which made it incredibly complicated and very much full of mystery. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And obviously very emotional and very frantic. Uh, this was right around Christmas 2006, which also made it be a little extra painful for all the families as well. So this is Genyan Massif. It's this beautiful mountain range in western Sichuan province where they had um, where they had climbed. I think you can probably see the line that they had climbed is up there on the right of your screen. I've got it sort of marked in yellow. So just wanted you to have a picture of the the peak that they were attempting. So as this process for me began, the process of researching and writing the book, the first place I went is research. So I poured over my mom's research and I began really reading every book that felt that to me like it could fall into the category of what I would call mountaineering narrative or mountaineering literature. And, you know, there's so many of these books. And so I read book after book after book and some were better than others. Most of them were written by men. Most of them were memoirs, and I read book after book, as I said, until they sort of started to sound the same to me. And at that point, I began to realize that what I wanted to read didn't exist. And what I wanted as a non-mountaineer was something that could teach me a little bit about the sport on a pretty basic level, but also a book that had humanity and depth. And so by that point, I had access to Chris's journals. And so I had really begun to get to know her. And I had begun talking to all of her family and friends. And I knew that I wanted to capture her spirit because she was just so full of energy and love for the mountains. But I wasn't really interested in writing just a biography because I was so fascinated, as I've already said, in the details around climbing and the science around training for these big expeditions, the complexities of running large scale expeditions was fascinating to me. And I wanted something that could teach me and others and also inspire us and motivate us and move us and, and really captivate people. So basically I wanted to write a book that would be something that I would want to read and I wasn't finding it. So that was a turning point for me when I realized that what I wanted to write didn't exist and it certainly didn't exist with a female alpinist at the center of the story. So that was exciting to realize that I was getting into something that um, was hopefully going to be pretty special. So here's another picture of Chris. I love this picture of her and her tent. So as you can imagine, this process and project quickly got bigger than I could have imagined. I ended up interviewing 
75, I, I think I usually say 75 to 100 people because I kind of lost track at some point. And I read everything I could, could get my hands on. I did several trips back and forth to Seattle, went to Telluride and Norwood several times. And then eventually I did go to China and I was able to retrace Chris and Charlie's last steps. So as I was going through this process of both research and then also writing, I was constantly falling down what I like to describe as rabbit holes in this process as a writer. And this is because, as I've already said, so much of this sport and this world is just so juicy and intriguing. And it's why we really all read these books so voraciously. The lifestyles and the personalities are fascinating, the large scale expeditions, the life of Sherpa and the support staff. I got very lost for many weeks on researching the environmental impact of mountaineering. There's a lot in the book about sort of the spirituality and the ethics of climbing sacred peaks, of which Genyan, the last mountain that Chris and Charlie climbed, was and currently is one. And then I also obviously got very interested in trauma and loss and how that affects people in the world of climbing and how they, um, how they deal with that. And then obviously very interested and intrigued in the role of women in leadership positions in these sports that are really dominated by men. So I wanted to include all of that. And ultimately, I think I wrote a story that has a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of that. And it weaves together really interesting side stories. There are many, many other characters in the book besides Chris, but the story really is grounded in her story and the story of this very humble woman and her passion to climb. So just a couple other quick intros on people you will meet in the story. This is Chris's husband, Keith Boscoff. He got her hooked on the sport in the mid to late 90s. He was 17 years older than her. He was an architect and they met in Atlanta when she was working at Lockheed. And he really taught her everything she knew um, for the first few years of mountaineering about the sport and was a really energetic, incredible man. This is Scott Fisher. I think I've got a couple pictures of Scott here. So Scott Fisher and Chris met one time. They met in 1995, and that was the year before he died on Everest. And so this was really fascinating because that occasion on which they met was a scene that I wanted to really recreate. And it was tricky because all of the players in that particular scene were deceased. So part of the challenge with this scene and a few others was that many of the players had died. And so I was very adamant as I wrote that I wanted this to remain wholly a work of nonfiction. And so what that really involved was that I had to do tons of research, lots of communicating with people who had heard about those conversations and then running those scenes past people who knew the people in the scenes who had deceased just to make sure that they sounded authentic. Um, and as I said, I think there ended up only being about two or three scenes in the book that are recreated, but I was really adamant that those were as authentic as possible. Another picture of Scott Fisher. And then we've got a couple pictures of Charlie Fowler. So this is a young Charlie Fowler ice climbing somewhere. And I think at one point I knew exactly where this was. And you guys actually might know better than me somewhere in Colorado and I can't remember where, but this is a great picture and it was taken by Alex Lowe who um, died in 1999, I want to say, uh, and was a great friend and, and climbing partner of Charlie in, in those sort of early years. And this is an older picture of, of Charlie Fowler that I love. This is Chris's best friend. Her name uh, is Jane Courage and thankfully she is still with us. And she has actually become a very dear friend of mine and really instrumental in helping me understand Chris and the way she sort of approached life and her sense of humor and has helped me understand those little nuances that I definitely wanted to capture in writing an entire book about, about a person who was no longer with us. So Jane Courage, you will get to know pretty well in the book. This is a man named Keely Sherpa. He was Chris's lead Sherpa during the years that she ran Mountain Madness, and he became a very dear friend of hers. Um, she and Keith basically picked him out of obscurity. He was guiding, not even guiding, I think he was maybe just um, 
a porter at the time that they met in the late 90s, but she eventually elevated him so that he was running the operations in Nepal and they became very, very close. And actually he was with her for her first attempt and summit of Mount Everest in the year 2000. We actually just passed the 20th anniversary of her summit of Everest in May of 2000. So Keely Sherpa is another one you will get to know in the book. Fantastic guy who's still also with us. He lives in Kathmandu and I was able to spend some time with him and his family. So this is Genyan Valley, the site of Chris and Charlie's last trip. And it's just an astonishingly beautiful valley with these really beautiful. You can see that the peaks are just incredibly jagged. I think in the book I described them as the Tetons on crack. I think that's how I describe them. They're gorgeous and there are just beautiful rushing rivers everywhere you turn. The, this particular monastery, um, which is one of the places Chris and Charlie last frequented, is at about 16,000 feet. So there are very few hab inhabitants in this part of China. And I was able to travel there to write those last few chapters of the book in a really authentic way. That was important to me. And being there was just truly magical. And I think more than anything, it really helped me put things in perspective. And I think being in wild places does that for all of us, really. It helps us all sort of understand, you know, have a sense of peace and be able to justify and, and be able to describe to people what it is that drives us to climb and seek unexplored places. So very, very special place. This is actually a picture of me with a couple of the monks that live at the monastery that sits at the base of the mountain that Chris and Charlie had climbed. So you can see sort of in the middle of that picture, the, the tip top of Genyan there, it's about a 20,000 foot mountain. So spending time with the monks was really invaluable because they remembered Charlie and Chris and I was able to talk to them about the power of the mountains and what they remembered about their interactions with Charlie and Chris that all of the monks that I met didn't remember, but there were definitely a few. And some of the monks um, spoke Chinese, which I speak a little bit of Chinese, so I was able to kind of roughly communicate with them in Chinese. But then many of them only spoke Tibetan, which was a little trickier because I do not speak Tibetan. And so there was quite a bit of um, pantomiming and drawing pictures and sort of silly moments with the monks. It was very fun. So saying we talk to each other is maybe a little bit of a stretch. So, so just a couple more things before I um, turn it over for questions. So a word or two about how I started this journey and kind of what I took away from the process. I think I mentioned at the beginning that this was a book that my mother had started years ago. And so I like to sort of talk about the backstory and how it landed in my lap because I think it's worth noting. Uh, Chris and I were both raised in Appleton, Wisconsin. And it's a city in Northeast Wisconsin, which is about as far away, I like to say, about as far away from the greater Himalayan range as you can be. I think the altitude is like 75 or something. <laughs> Um, but we, yeah, we both were from Appleton and we were from the same high school. We went to the same high school. She was three years older than me and we did go to the same high school, but we never met. We actually lived only a few miles apart as well, but in kind of those funny twists of fate, she and I never met. So we graduated and we left Appleton and eventually after many years, we both ended up in Colorado and Chris was with Charlie near Telluride and I was in Denver with my family. And as I've said, I wasn't a climber. So I wasn't really in that world. And that's one reason who, that I didn't know who she was. I really didn't know who she was. But the bigger and more compelling reason I didn't know her is because she was just so darn humble. By the time she died in 2006, she had summited more 8,000 meter peaks than any other American woman, which makes her the counterpart and did at that time to many, many very famous and well-known uh, male alpinists. I think at that time, Ed Vesters was attempting to climb all 14 8,000 meter peaks and did in the late 90s, early 2000s, I believe. But nobody knew her name. Um, so she was just very under the radar screen so that even being from the same smallish hometown, I didn't know her. 
So it wasn't until 2006 when Chris and Charlie went missing that there was a little article published in the hometown paper in Appleton, Wisconsin. And my mom saw it and called and asked if I knew her and I didn't know her. And my mother was really intrigued and began looking into her story. And once she understood the depth of Chris's accomplishments, she was really convinced that the story needed to be told. And so at that point, she reached out to Chris's mom who lived, again, still just a few miles away. And the mothers forged this really lovely friendship over many years as my mom worked on the book. And so eventually that friendship was passed on to me along with my mom's many boxes of research and the hopes that one day Chris's story would be told. So I really love ending there. And I think it's kind of interesting and notable how this all started because I really was and still am sort of just a regular person who's really captivated by mountain stories and holding on to the question. And I was intrigued by the question of why do mountaineers and climbers do this and what drives them? which is a question so many people have who don't have that passion for the mountains that most of us do. And the way that I like to describe it now to people who sometimes come to the book and they just can't understand it or they're frustrated by those choices or they say that that's such a selfish sport, which I was never one of those people. I had questions about that, but I never really understood that mentality. So now when I have those conversations with people, it's wonderful because I'm able to say to them, okay, so stop for a minute and think about your own life and think about the one thing that you cannot imagine not having or practicing or doing or creating, whatever that might be. And maybe it's parenting or gardening or yoga or fostering animals or worshiping God or running. So that is the thing that drives you. And that is the same passion that people have to be in the mountains and to climb. And so I think sometimes when there is an elevated level of risk, people feel entitled to criticize those choices. And I do think that there's a different equation, of course, when spouses and children are involved in all of that and all the safety precautions obviously need to be taken, et cetera, et cetera. And I get that. But I still think having gone through all of this research and written this book now, and it's very clear to me and probably to most of you, obviously, that in order to feel whole, people should really be allowed to embrace whatever passions drive them. That's something that I hope people take away from this book, especially non-mountaineers and non-climbers. So something for you to think about as you read. And I think I will stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Let's see if I can do that. Stop share. There we go. Great. I think I'm back, Bella, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Let's see. And I'm happy to take advice on porcupines for future <laughs> reference. <laughs> from you mountaineers out there, what to do. <sighs> so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. But I do have one question for you to start off. Right. And then I'll go with Sarah's question. Okay. So... How did you know when you were done researching and ready to write? Or was it an ongoing process? Mm -hmm. how, That's how a good did question. you tackle it? Yeah, yeah. So great question. So let's see. I had my mom's research and she had talked to maybe 10 to 15 people over the course of many, many years. She was still working full time. So she was kind of working on this on the weekends. And so I started with those 10 to 15 people and inevitably at the end of those conversations, they would say, you should also talk to these three people, two or three people. So then I would talk to those two or three people. And then eventually after I had talked to 75 people, I would sort of start getting the same names and I was able to say, oh my gosh, okay. So I've already talked to those people. So then I realized, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm close to being done. I'm close to being done. So that was how I knew that I could probably start writing. Good question. Okay, so Sarah asked, she'd like to hear how you came up with the title for your book. Ooh, also a good question. So 
I love, I don't know if you you guys are like this, but I love it when I'm reading a book and the title of the book is buried in the book. And all of a sudden you come across the title. And so you will find the title in the book. And I will tell you that it comes up in the second half. And it's kind of this moment when it takes your breath away because uh, it's kind of a really tense, pivotal moment. And it was a real, it was a real conversation that people were having. And you'll, that's all I'll say. You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Let's see, here's another one. Can you read us a paragraph of the book? Do you have it out with you? Yeah, I do have it out <laughs> with me. Yes, I do. Um, I can. Yeah, I have a short passage that sometimes I read. And I, have it, I actually do have it marked, thankfully. So this is actually, this is a passage. It's super short. Um, and it is from Chris's summit on Everest. I think I mentioned she did that in the year 2000. And she was attempting Everest with Peter Hobler, who was one of the first two individuals to summit Everest without oxygen. He did that with Reinhold Messner in many, many years, I think like 20 years prior. And he was attempting Everest again in the year 2000 with Chris as his climbing partner, which is super special. And so eventually he was not able to summit and Chris kind of kept going because she was quite strong at that point. She was kind of at the apex of her career. And so she was attempting to summit with Keeley Sherpa. And so I love this particular passage. It's Chris and Keeley in their tent. And I think this was somewhere between, I don't know, maybe camp three or so. And she was really struggling with not wanting to use bottled oxygen. She wanted to summit without oxygen and Keeley was worried about her and was trying to convince her to take bottled oxygen. So this is that scene. Chris, you should use oxygen. We're at South Coal. You need it now. I don't want it, she said. Even if I did, I don't have a tank. Keeley nodded, pulling his mask off and holding it out to her. Her blue eyes looked tired, her voice weak. The space between them felt strained by the disagreement. Yes, I know, he said, you can use mine. If you're beaten up by the altitude, it's a big problem here. Even myself, strong Sherpa, I get very tired. She balked at the idea. I really wanted to do this without O's, Keeley. I did, Peter did too. You have come to climb Everest, Chris. You are strong, stronger than me, but if you get sick, Keeley couldn't begin to think about her falling ill on his watch. They stared at each other, neither budging until Chris spoke. Just to get through the night? Yes, just that, he said. She reached for the mask in silence as Keeley adjusted the dial on the regulator. Placing it over her mouth and nose, she inhaled, closing her eyes. Oxygen poured into her body, precious and life-sustaining. As she drew in three more breaths, her body softened into the sleeping bag. She removed the mask and handed it to Keeley, who took three breaths of his own. Taking turns with the mask, the two gradually fell into hypoxic sleep. Everest. <laughs> so, oh, Sarah also said she really enjoyed hearing about your mom and that, can you see the chat? I can, but I, I have to like kind of pay attention to it so I'm not no. seeing all the comments. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, um, Good. I love, I love that story about my mom, too. The story. She said she's also a Wisconsin person living in Colorado. So that's exciting. Great. <laughs> that's super exciting because there are a lot of Wisconsinites in Colorado, as you all know, and they are finding a lot of meaning in this story because Chris is kind of a hometown hero, right? What kind of girl from a small town in Wisconsin goes on to be the most accomplished American female mountaineer of all time? It's pretty special. So good connection. And Bobby asked, how did you transition from engineering to writing? Which I'm also very curious. Mm, okay, so Chris was the aerospace engineer and she did the transition from engineering to mountaineering. I wonder if that was her question. Was her question about Chris or me? I'm not sure. Chris was an aerospace engineer who kind of fell in love with mountaineering and made that leap because she just fell in love with the sport. So maybe that's what she was asking. She can clarify. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've made a few leaps from journalist to lawyer to college professor to writer. 
we all make leaps, don't we? <laughs> Definitely. And I'm mm-hmm. only 20. <laughs> Love it. Miss Susan said, now that you've completed all of your research on this amazing female climber, do you believe there are any reasons at all why women cannot succeed as well as men in mountaineering? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. No, none. In fact, I think women have a greater opportunity to be more successful because I think on some of these climbs, they have a sense of collaboration sometimes that men don't often have. So no, I mean, there are very few sports where the playing field is level. And I really believe that mountaineering is one of those. I think maybe like car racing is another one. There aren't that many, so they say. Um, But no, there's absolutely no reason why women can't excel at the same level as men at the sport. See, I've got one more question from... Yeah. Let's see, where is it? Do you feel a sense of responsibility for carrying on the memories of the people that you wrote about in this book? Yes, excellent. So I very much did. You know, it's interesting. I thought a lot about legacy and what that means and what it would look to me to someday have somebody write my story. Like what a huge responsibility that was. And particularly because it's not, I would never classify this as a biography but a story about many people, many who have passed, I definitely felt that responsibility. And so the way that I approached that was by just having so many conversations with people who knew all of the people in the book and making sure often that I would run sections of the book past them to make sure that it sounded like the person that they loved because I very much did not want somebody who knew this person Chris or Scott or Charlie to pick up the book and be surprised by something. I think a lot of writers do that. A lot of writers start books like this and they kind of like know what they want the ending to be and they know the image they want to portray of this person and off they go and they don't want to kind of do too much research because it might sort of shatter where they think they're going and I was very different. I started with a blank slate and then I let people fill in with all these different colors and kind of throw colors at this blank canvas. And then I felt like it was my job to kind of take all these colors and put it together into something really meaningful. And so it was arduous, but the result has been that everybody who loved the people who have perished, who are in this book, um, everybody has really enjoyed the book and spoke very, has spoken very highly of it. So that's been really rewarding. And does anyone else have any more questions before we wrap up tonight's chat? And Bella, will you save some of those sweet comments for me since I'm not looking at them? Yes, you I will. Can fill <laughs> in later? Okay, great. Sarah says, thank Good. you. Can't wait to read it. Me too. Oh, <laughs> I'm excited. Good. Yes, yes. So the book, I should also mention before you guys all sign off. So the book is available um, you can get it in those that big box online store that starts with the letter A, which actually they don't need any more of your money. <laughs> so if you can buy it at a local bookstore, that's a really good option. And you can also get it on my website. And I think that um, CMC has sent out a blast that if you buy it off my website, joannagarten.com, there's a place where you're checking out where you can enter a code. You enter the code adventure and then I'll give you 20% off the book for being a CMC gonna, friend. Let's see if I can paste it into the chat, the link mm. for you guys. Let's see. Oh, there you did. I think there you did it. And I see a few people on here who I think I've sent the book to. So yay. In fact, one person, I just did read a chat that somebody started it and maybe she said she's already almost done. It's a really fast read. <laughs> so that's good. It's perfect for the summer. Oh, what I was also going to say though, A lot of people prefer Kindles or eBooks, and so it's also available that way. And then some people prefer audiobooks, and it's actually already um, on audio. So you can get it on audio as well. So it's in lots of different forms, which I think bodes really well for the book. And um, I'm excited to see where it goes. It's getting great response. It's been very difficult to release a book in the middle of a global pandemic. So for those of you who end up reading it and enjoying it, 
I would so appreciate like a shout out on social media is awesome or a review. Unfortunately, the reviews on Amazon are the most important. So that would be really helpful um, to sort of spread the news. And hopefully I'll get out there. My book tour was canceled this spring, but I'm hoping to get out when the world's orbit is in a little bit better shape, like maybe next year. So hopefully I'll get out and I'll definitely be doing lots of events in the Denver area. So stay tuned, stay tuned. And we'll all be on this journey together. I'm already talking about selling the rights for mo a movie. So stay tuned, exciting. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And I wanna say a big thank you to Joanna for giving us a nice rundown on her new book and I, I can't wait to read it, so. <laughs> thank you, Bella. Have a good thank night, you. everybody.